Thanks so much for coming. I'm Jen Person, developer advocate for the Firebase team. Um, and I'm going to tell you a few things that I learned uh, while I decided to make an Instagram clone. But uh, before I get into sort of the nitty gritty, I want to really uh, detail, you know, I want to tailor what I'm speaking about to what it is that you already know. So uh, just by a show of hands, uh, how many of you are familiar with Firebase? Oh, wow, that is cool. I want a picture of that. <laughs> cool. Um, and in terms of features, who has used Cloud Firestore before? Oh, OK, perfect. So then uh, this is exactly what I want to talk about. So um, while I was scrolling Instagram, I started you know, thinking about what are some of these features here and how would I implement them um, you know, using some technologies that I'm familiar with. And of course, I'm most familiar with Firebase, although I'm going to talk about some other features as well. And so I decided to make an app um, that is like Instagram, but uh, for cats. And I called it Cat Calling. Um, and I'm just going to show you what that looks like, because it's sort of worth seeing here. Let's see if I have it uh, big enough up on the screen here. Come on, make it bigger. Cool. Um, so you can see that it has some of the core functionality. And visually, it is uh, pretty similar to Instagram. You have the name of the person. And some of these, I actually uh, I pulled Twitter and ha asked people to send me pictures of their cats. So it's their actual name and their cats and a description, and also um, a system of likes. And um, so that's what it looks like. Now. It's just an app for enjoying cats, right? That's pretty simple, right? Let's just share some photos of cats. But is it so simple? Of course not. That's, that's why I'm here giving a talk about it. Um, <laughs> so you know, there are a lot of things to consider. So first of all, you need a place just to store those cats' names and descriptions, but uh, you know, namely a database. But you're also going to need to store larger items like cat photos. No problem. I know I can do that using Firebase as well. Uh, I need to be able to verify who users are and keep track of what it is that they're doing. Uh, also verify that they're just photos of cats. You know, I don't want photos of like bread or goats or things like that. I mean, this is just for the love of cats. Um, and if you're asking why not dogs, it's just because I couldn't think of as good of a pun. So <laughs> maybe I'll make that as well. Um, and then you know, a way to really download photos seamlessly. I don't know if you've had this experience where you're just like waiting for the app to load and nothing's coming up and it's super frustrating. Uh, when I first made cat calling. It was, it was like an embarrassing amount of time before the photos loaded. So uh, you know, I want to talk about some of the things that I did to make that work a little better. So of course, I did that using Firebase. <laughs> yes, that's why I'm here. And very briefly, because uh, this talk was originally twice as long when I told it the first time, uh, here are just some of the features of Firebase. It's a whole suite of products to help you build your app and grow your user base. But I'm focusing on a couple today. So what I really want to talk about, I'm probably going to pick about three of these, depending on how much time we have, is Cloud Firestore and how I use that database uh, to implement the data model for my app, but just also some of the really nitty gritty of the problems that I came across with that. Uh, Firebase authentication, Google Cloud Storage for Firebase, Imagex, which is not a Firebase product, and MLKit for Firebase. Um, so think ahead if you can about what I might have used MLKit for. So, Cloud Firestore is a NoSQL database. And if you come from a SQL background, uh, my best suggestion is when you're using NoSQL, don't think about it at all. Don't, don't think about SQL at all. It's like an entirely different animal. I think that I was sort of blessed to come from a background of starting with NoSQL, so I had uh, no assumptions about how it was going to work. But things like denormalizing data, yeah, repeating data can be really confusing and seem really awkward if you're coming from a relational database background. Now, if you've used the real-time database before, which it, you know, for those of you who are familiar with Firebase, I assume that your background probably has to do more with the real-time database. You may know that it's just sort of a, essentially like a big JSON blob, right? And anytime you query data, you're getting all the information that's under a specific path. Cloud Firestore is, in my opinion, uh, much better because instead of just being a, one big blob, it's organized into collections with documents inside of them. And what this enables you to do is make more shallow queries and just query at a certain level rather than getting all the data underneath. 
inside of a document. You can have sub-collections of other documents so that uh, your data model matches what your app looks like without you having to pull all of that data at once. And I'll show you what that looks like. Also, you have better querying power. One of the most frustrating parts about the real-time database is the lack of ability to do more powerful queries. Um, Cloud Firestore has a lot more to that based on how its indexing works. Now, I'm not going to get too much in that, into that right now, but if you're interested, you can come see me after in the office hours. Also, check out our Firebase YouTube channel. Todd, Todd Kerpelman did a great series on getting to know Cloud Firestore, and he really got into how the indexing works in Cloud Firestore and why you can and can't do certain queries. Also, it scales effortlessly. Rather than uh, your uh, query scaling by the size of your entire database, it just scales by the amount of results that you get back. So um, it's really powerful. Oh, yeah, you know, so just briefly, here are some uh, different things that you can store, text strings, date, time, integer, booleans, bytes, maps, arrays, and subcollections. Uh, just as a side note, there's almost no reason to store an array. It's better just to have it as a map because you can always put something in an array later. But for the sake of time, let's talk about what I put in my app specifically. I had two collections, one for cats, one for users, and each of these contains a bunch of documents. And the keys for the documents, for the cats, are just random IDs. For the users, it's their user ID. Now, diving in. I love that effect. Uh, the only reason I chose Kino is so I could do that effect. Uh, diving into a specific document, you can see I have some information in here. I have the image URL for where the cat's image is in cloud storage. I also have this image path for Imagix, which I definitely want to talk about later. Name of the cat, uh, the note about the cat, a timestamp, and the number of likes. Now, if you're coming from the real-time database, please note that these random push IDs, like the one that's created here, unlike the real-time database, they are not generated using the timestamps, so they are not automatically in order. So if you want to be able to query things by time, you are going to want to include a timestamp like I did here. Now, how do I handle likes? If I wanted this to just look like Instagram, I could just uh, you know, use a transaction read that amount and just you know, increment it by one when I have likes. But that is simply not scalable, it's not measurable. If I'm looking at thousands of people liking something, uh, that's not gonna scale, and how do I keep track of who specifically has liked it so I can show the correct UI? Well, the way that I've done that is using a sub-collection inside of each, each cat document. And what that includes is a bunch of documents of likes. Whew. Oh yeah. Okay, so each document, um, the document ID for that document is the user ID of the person that did the like. Then the, the data inside of it, I just put the user ID and true inside of it again. It really doesn't have any relevant information in it right now, but going forward, as I get more learns, perhaps I would need some more you know, pertinent information. The way that you keep track of these, uh, you have a bunch of backend options you can use. Cloud Functions for Firebase is a great way to do it because you can trigger a function to run anytime you write a new like, then it can add them up and update that like count for you. And the reason I'm not showing that now is because it's in uh, JavaScript, and last time I checked, this is Tri Swift. So uh, if you'd like to see some more about Cloud Functions, you know, you know, you know where to find me. Um, so let's look at what that specific code looks like. And I'm gonna have a drink briefly. Oh, man. Okay, so um, in order to query my documents, I start with, uh, I get a Firestore instance, I get the collection cats, and this is where if I wanted to do some sort of special query, maybe I want to order by timestamp, maybe I want to look at just the ones that came from a specific user, this is where I would get that, but right now I'm just doing a query of the entire cats collection. And then I call get documents, right, I always forget that I do this, boom, get documents, and get documents has a completion handler, uh, which is going to pass snapshot or error. Each of these is an optional. Um, you know, I'm just not the best practice here. I'm just doing if let and error and printing the error. But of course, if this was an actual application, I'd want to do more to handle that error, and then you know, uh, not force and wrap the snapshot. But the assumption is I'll have one or the other. So if this is my closure and I iterate through all my cat documents and I create a cat object out of them, I make an array of cats, what is this going to print? Uh, so because it's outside of my closure, 
it's just going to print an empty array of cats. And this, I'd say, is the number one kind of question that I see on Twitter and Stack Overflow for anybody who's starting out with Firebase because it works asynchronously. This is a very frustrating when you're first starting out because you're like, I know the data's there. I printed something inside of it. Why isn't the data outside of it? So how can I handle this? Um, certainly, I can just, you know, put everything inside of here, right? You know, if I put all this code into my massive view controller, instead of print cats, this could be my, you know, table view reload data or whatever I'm doing to uh, reload my view, I can update everything inside of here. But, you know, that's really not going to be very scalable, especially if you want to be able to apply something like this to multiple different views. So instead, uh, you know, it's better to add your own completion handler. So what I do here is I put it all in this function that I'm calling download cats. On completion, it passes a cat array and returns void. Then when I have all of my cats, I call completion cats. Notice I also move my cat array in there. So if for some reason there's some kind of error that happens, I'm still just sending back an empty array of cats. There are some other things I could do there like either pass an optional error back to the user, et cetera. But then um, in my view controller, when I call download cats, yay, much better. I can assign that cats array to my view and then reload the data, which is what I ended up doing. OK, I'm going to talk about auth for two seconds because I want to get to some more fun stuff. Auth is really hard. Um, I think that we can all agree on that. It's so important. but. Firebase auth makes it easier. So Firebase authentication gives you a whole bunch of options right out of the box, like uh, signing in with email and password, Google authentication, Facebook, Twitter, GitHub, anonymous authentication, which is super useful for if you want to get someone in and using your app without making them sign in right off the bat. The, ben the benefit of using anonymous auth authentication is you can also then turn that user into another user. So if they then sign in with Google, you can transfer that user ID to the Google user so it follows them. And we also have now phone number auth, so you can send them a text message, and existing auth system. So if you have some system that your company requires or something you prefer, you can still use Firebase custom authentication, which is really helpful, but to me, even more important than enabling you to sign in with just a couple lines of code is what it gets you in terms of rules. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just getting over a cold, so. Um, this is an example of the Cloud Firestore rules that I created for my app. And so they all sort of start with this sort of service Cloud Firestore, oop, and then, you know, match to your specific database this is just going forward to support in case we end up with <clears throat> multiple database support in the future. But more importantly, <clears throat> sorry, <coughs> I don't want to cough in everyone's ear, um, is this match here, which allows me to match to a specific path. In this case, it's all of my cat documents or all of my user's documents, and I can have unique rules for each of these. So in this case, for my cats, I want everyone to be able to read or write to the cats collection if they are authenticated. So request.auth.uid does not equal null. But in terms of users, I only want you to be able to write to your own collection. I don't want you to go in and be able to like say that you're somebody else and write to that. So I am able to use the wildcard of the path, see UID from there, <coughs> and this way, you can only write to a path if the document ID is equal to your own user ID. So to me, that's really the best part about Firebase authentication is that you can then apply it in rules to really protect your data. I recommend when you're making a Firebase app, start by structuring your rules because you will find down the line, if you choose not to do that, that um, you end up with a data structure that's really challenging to secure. Because you'll be like, oh, but now I know I, I want people to be able to use this data, but not that data. And you're going to start making <clears throat> more and more complex rules when off the bat, it would be better to take a look at those. 
So I definitely recommend, recommend checking out our documentation on that. And if you have any questions on how it works, you know where to find me. Ah, oh, OK. <clears throat> Hope I got that out now. OK. Um, but even more importantly is you can have different rules for subcollections. So remember, I had that sub subcollection of likes inside of each cat's document. So each cat post has its own list of likes. And I don't want someone to be able to go through and spam and say, oh, look at how many people liked this post. So uh, you can allow read and write if, the, again, the request.auth.uid, that user's user ID matches the path. They can only write to their own specific document. They can turn it on and off, like it and then not like it. Um, so to store the images, I stored them in Google Cloud Storage for Firebase, which it's got some really great features. You know, I'm not going to knock it. I think it's great that it has multiple buckets and region selection, um, but I wanted to do the free part. <laughs> so I didn't want to incorporate those multiple buckets. And what I found was just flat out storing my images um, in cloud storage and then downloading them would kind of took a little while. I'm wondering if I can show that to you. So I'll see if I can uh, uh, duplicate it right now. But the solution I came up with was ImageX. I thought about a few different things I could do. I said, oh, I can upload my images to cloud storage. I could trigger a cloud function that can maybe like make a lower resolution version of those images and then make sure that they're square. And then I could download those. And there's all sorts of things I could do with that that way. But it was quickly getting complex. But ImageX, wow, it, it was really a lifesaver. Um, ImageX is not a Google product. Um, it was just something a friend suggested to me. And according to their own website, they give you a full range of creative imaging solutions so you can put every pixel to work impressing your customers. So what does that really mean? You're able to do resizing and cropping, compression and performance, responsive design, and I can attest to this, faster delivery of your images. But most importantly, I was able to achieve all of this just by modifying my download URL. So that meant I didn't have to have some different version of this that I was using every time. I could just add some details to the download URL and uh, get a different image. Now, I will say that, again, it's not a Google product. It does cost money. I don't know how much it is off the top of my head, but it is definitely a feature to look into. So I'll show you kind of what that looks like here. Ching. So <laughs> I have uh, an image, and uh, it is from ImageX, and basically I have it set up so that ImageX will mirror a certain folder of my cloud storage, and I can basically pass it my credentials and enable it to do that. And it will cache images closer to the location of where they're downloaded so you can get faster speeds, and um, you can also do things like <clears throat> cropping. So just off the bat by adding like crop and entropy, um, fit equals crop, rather. I can change some things about it. They have different kinds of cropping. And uh, basically, entropy looks for where it sees the most action in it. Edges looks for where it thinks the edge of the image is. I sort of did an extreme version here by doing um, extreme uh, you know, cropping so you can see the difference. But what this enables me to do is upload images of any dimensions and then download images that no matter what, they come out square. So <clears throat> I incorporated that into my settings here so that I could sort of play around with it if I wanted to. So I could do 115, cropping. And there we go. You, you have your cropped images. And this way, you could even uh, play with it really quickly and see what kind of images are, are going to be fast enough to download and then also give the user the best experience. And if I toggle it off, I don't know if I can, eh. you can sort of see, eh. it's, it's still a little better because I've been caching my images, but when I toggle it off, it takes longer to download the images because it's downloading full size. I'm going to toggle that back on. Yeah, so I can't say enough great stuff about ImageX. Um, how many of you have heard of it before? A couple of you? Cool. I definitely say uh, check it out. It was one of the best parts of really making my app 
scroll smoothly and work well. And uh, that was the quickest way to get it rid of that like really embarrassing download time that I was looking at. And you can experiment with it so easily that um, it's, it's so nice to try to get your, your like best images out. OK, so any idea what I might have used MLKit for? For, yeah, so I use MLKit for Firebase to pull out just the images of cats. Um, so MLKit for Firebase has some base APIs that it offers you straight out of the box. <coughs> Sorry. And you can read them while I'm drinking this water. Yeah. So it has text recognition, image labeling, barcode scanning, face detection, and landmark recognition, and we're adding more all the time. Um, these APIs, for the most part, have a mobile component, so it works exclusively on the client, and then a cloud comp component, which would work in the cloud. The benefit of the mobile component is that it doesn't need any internet connection, and it's free, which is a nice price. Um, the benefit of using the cloud component is the accuracy is much higher. So based on what kind of uh, accuracy you need, you can choose which one you want. Uh, if you go to the Firebase console, you can see those there. But uh, this is as simple as it was to add on-device image labeling um, for my app. I just get a label detector. Um, I call detect on it. I pass the image. And it sends me back a list of labels of things that it thinks may be in the image. Now, when I used the on-device labeling, I like sort of shot myself in the foot because it was working really well in testing. And then when I went to showcase it, um, it detected a cat in the photo, even though there wasn't one. So I'm going to show you and see. Hopefully, hopefully it won't mess me up this time. But um, I have it set up so that when I click Add Cat, um, we're all pretty familiar with these photos by now, yeah. Um, but I've added this one that clearly doesn't have a cat. I saw it last time I had a goat. I think that was a little close. Maybe I'm cheating now by choosing geese, but this is a cat. And so when I click share, before it actually uploads any of the information, it runs that code and sees if it detects a cat. And then, oh, sorry, this is not a cat. So it will not let me. Um, it will not let me upload that image. Um, <clears throat> now, when it comes to buying into uh, a backend as a service or anything, I find that uh, iOS developers are the most picky. And I love that about all of you. <laughs> I love that the questions about what am I really buying into here? Do I really want to bloat my application? What, what am I getting into? So I highly recommend you find out very specifically what it is that you're getting into. Our SDK is open source, and you can check it out at, at this link and really see what, what is going on behind the scenes. And even better, um, you can do some pull requests, which we always appreciate. Thank you. Um, we also have Firebase UI, which has some out-of-the-box solutions. So um, you know, if you want even more support than the SDK, what Firebase UI allows you to do is uh, drop in some things like uh, you, you know, attach the data model to a table view very easily. Um, also, my favorite part of it is auth. So if you check out Firebase UI auth, that has some out-of-the-box authentication that just does a pop-up window. It's just a couple lines of code to add each different kind of authentication you want. I would say it's probably not the best for an app that you're going to want to put in the App Store. But while you're getting started, rather than spending time with some boilerplate code, that will enable you to get started. So we really appreciate you taking a look at that and, of course, helping us out. Um, also, if you're really excited to see the latest and greatest features that we have, uh, MLKit just came out at I.O., so it was very recently. Um, sign up for our alpha program. We're always, especially iOS developers, we could always use more of you. So come, tell us what's wrong with our products, <laughs> take a look at it, we really appreciate that. So that's just a couple of the things that I learned, and I absolutely blasted through it. The first time I did this talk, again, it was 
50 minutes, I, I cut out a lot. So if you're interested in some more things like uh, cloud functions, how those rules work, um, go ahead and come to the office hours and I'd love to talk about it more or any other questions that you have about Firebase. Um, but I want to keep moving along because I know you guys are probably getting hungry, yeah? So uh, thank you so much.